Homage to him, the Holy One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, this first sutta is going to be the the uh, Baya Barawa Sutta. It's number four in the Majima Nikaya. And this is um, an enlightened unenlightened bodhisattva story, that's what I call it, because he's talking to you, the Buddha is going to be talking to you, and the Buddha is going to be referring in the first part um, to the fact that that he was a bodhisattva when this happened, and um, that's where we know he's talking to the monks from his own experience, and what he did concerning the distractions what he did was he shared the information with the monks in several suttas, his precise solution for the distractions when they came up and talked about them, how they work and such like that. So you might want to take notes because this is good stuff. And we'll start at the beginning. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetas Grove Anatha Pindikas Park. And then the Brahmin, Janasoni, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and he said, Master Godama, when clansmen have gone forth from the home life into the homelessness out of faith, in Master Gotama, do they have Master Gotama for their leader, their helper, and their guide? And do these people follow the example of Master Gotama? That is so, Brahman. That is so. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, out of faith in me, they have me for their leader, their helper, and their guide. And these people follow my example. But Master Gotama, remote jumble thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice. It is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind, if he has no concentration. That is so, Brahman, that is so. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice. It is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles might rob a person of his mind. And if he has no concentration, he would be lost. Before my enlightenment, when I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too considered thus, remote, jungle, thicket, resting places in the forest are hard to endure. The jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. I considered thus, whatever recluses and Brahmins, unpurified in bodily conduct, resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, and owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, unpurified in body and conduct. I am purified in bodily conduct. I resort to remote 
jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with bodily conduct purified. Seeing in myself this purity of bodily conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. So when we're talking about bodily conduct, we're talking about keeping the precepts. We're talking about Sheila, our conduct in life. <clears throat> we know also that the bodily conduct protects us if it is purified and we are keeping our precepts, that it protects us from the hindrances happening. So why do the hindrances happen is because of a breakdown in the Sheila. That's one of the reasons. So he's in this sutta, what you hear him doing is he is embracing the contradiction from the unwholesome to the wholesome in each one of the pieces that are mentioned in the sutta, and there's 16 different things that can cause you distractions in your practice and break down your progress. So he's talking systematically in the sutta, this time with abandoning what is wrong and bringing up what is wholesome from the unwholesome to the wholesome mind state. The first one is bodily conduct. Then the second, I considered thus, whatever recluses in Brahman unpurified in their verbal conduct resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, owing to the defect of their unpurified verbal conduct. These good recluses in Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places using in, in the forest, keeping purified verbal conduct. I resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with bodily, I'm sorry, with verbal conduct purified. It's tricky because I have to do the switch back. So bear with me. The next one is, it says, I considered thus when recluses and Brahmins unpurified in their mental conduct resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified mental conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread as well. But I do not resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest with an unpurified mental conduct. I am purified in mental conduct. And seeing in myself this purity of mental conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. So the first thing he's done here, he's taken the, uh, the bodily and then the verbal and then the mental conduct and pointed out that when he goes to sit, he has been keeping the precepts. So he's purified in that way, then he's not going to have the blockages come up. The next one, I considered whenever recluses and Brahmins unpurified in their livelihood or in their lifestyle, the way we talk to you about the lifestyle. If they resort to jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they, they will evoke fear and dread. But I do not resort to the remote jungle resting places in the forest with an unpurified livelihood or lifestyle. I have purified my lifestyle and found great solace in dwelling in the forest. So if you have nothing bothering you about your livelihood, nothing bothering you about uh, the, um, what's happened in the way that you've been working, when you go into the forest, nothing's gonna pop up in relationship to this. And that's what we have to keep remembering. You may have been at a retreat, it's 
possible you heard this story, but I'll tell you one very, very quickly about the woman who was the butcher for the pigs in the village. And she's butchering the pigs her whole life. And when she got ill with a terminal illness, she had a high fever and she was in the village and suffering greatly when her children came in. And her sister said, you know, it might comfort her if we went to the butcher's hut and we got her knives. She was always very proud of her knives that she used when she was butchering the pigs. And so they went and they got these knives for her and they uh, brought them to where, uh, to where she was uh, lying down in the bed suffering. And they, they told her very quietly, we've put your knives here beside you. We know how much they mean to you. It wasn't a good idea. She had a tremendous amount of guilt inside her because of doing this her whole entire life. She ended up jumping, falling basically out of the bed and crawling around as if she was a pig. And it was very upsetting to the family and they were very, very, very upset about what happened. But all of a sudden the livelihood that she had 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 been bearing down on her. And because it was a tradition of her father, she had done this and followed suit for many years, but never talked to anyone about how she felt about it. This is an example of how if she had gone into the forest and she had been meditating, what if this came up in her mind? How disturbing would it have been for her to attempt to do her meditation? So he says, basically, he went in he knew he was purified in his lifestyle and he resorted to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with livelihood that was purified. And seeing in myself this purity in my livelihood, I found great solace in the forest, dwelling in the forest. Then he says, I considered thus what whenever recluses or Brahmins who are covetous and full of lust. Whenever they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places full of covetousness and lust. I am uncovetous when I remote, go to these remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones. And with that in mind, I see myself this purity of uncovetousness and I find great solace in dwelling in the forest. And then he considered thus, whenever recluses and Brahmins are unpurified with a mind of ill will and intentions of hate, and they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to that defect of the unpurified mind of ill will and intentions of hate, These good recluses and Brahmins cannot stay within the forest. But when I resort to the forest, I would go there with a mind of loving kindness. And seeing in myself the purity of this loving kindness, I find great solace in dwelling in the forest. And you know, this is really true. And I can attest to this for you because in Missouri, on the mountain where we are in, you know, Damasuka, I used to go across the stream and hike up the side of the mountain to where there was a cliff and there were a bunch of really neat trees, big old trees. And I used to like to sit up there, um, especially on this big rock where there was a big old tree right next to me, big right in front of me. And 
people say they don't understand. How can loving kindness make a difference when I'm practicing? How can it affect anybody else? And you know, actually it really can because it has an energy. And the energy that flows out from loving kindness really makes a difference when you're sitting in the forest. Now that particular day I had gone up there because I wanted to sit with a robe, an old robe that Bonte had given to me to use to go up on the side of the hill. He, you know, he said, you can have this one. It's a really old one. It was 16 years old and um, it was a brown robe. I had been wearing purple robes at that time. So I put the brown robe on, wrapped it around me and covered myself up so mosquitoes couldn't get me. And I was sitting for close to two hours when all of a sudden I could tell there was something moving around at my feet. I opened my eyes, but I didn't move at all. I was in a pretty good amount of equanimity. This didn't bother me at all. I felt something next to me on the seat. That was a chipmunk. I looked down below me and there was a squirrel and a chipmunk. And then I looked on the rock to my left, just out the corner of my eye, and the birds were getting closer and closer. You know, <clears throat> in that moment, I really knew that the story of St. Francis of Assisi was true, that the birds would come over and sit with you. And then, you know, I finished my sitting. I thought it was really nice that this had happened. I guess I was kind of full of myself because I had enough equanimity for this to happen. I was walking down the mountain. I had a funny thought cross my mind. I told Bonte what happened. And he said, yep, that's the way it can work. And I said, yeah, but we shouldn't get, I shouldn't get too proud of myself or heady about this because look at the reality. He said, what? And I said, well, well, you see the, the, the robe was brown and the, the tree was brown and uh, the tree, it didn't move. And uh, I didn't move. And so there really isn't not an extraordinary thing here, but why did they feel so comfortable coming right near me when normally I would sit in a chair and they wouldn't come anywhere near me? So the energy that comes from you when you're practicing loving kindness is commuted out as it goes out and the animals can sense it much more than we people do. This is kind of interesting. It's a real thing. The next one here, I considered thus, whenever recluses and Brahmins who are covetousness, I'm sorry, who are overcome with sloth and torpor. So the next one is sloth and torpor. And with sloth and torpor, they result to resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. But owing to the defect of their unpurified situation, overcome with sloth and torpor, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to the jungle thicket resting places in the forest unpurified by being overcome with sloth and torpor. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones. And I am sitting without sloth and torpor. Now, how do we just sit without sloth and torpor? We talk about sloth and torpor as a hindrance. We know that the sloth and the torpor is when you start to get lazy, less interested in your energy drops. And when your interest in your friend slips down when you're ascending into your friend or whatever you're doing for your object of meditation, when it slips, we tell you a lot of times, if you stop and get up, you can walk forward and backwards and get more energy and try again. This sloth and torpor, you can say to yourself, and communication with your mind is a big part of your practice of meditation. We think as a human being, we're superior and we've decided to sit down and look at what's going on in our mind. Actually, 
This is a communication training center. We're teaching you to communicate with your mind so that in the future, if something's happening, people are hurt and they're just across the street from you, you don't, without even going across the street, if you start looking in that direction, tipping your head down in that direction, Sending loving kindness, it can go across the street and calm everyone down in the case of an accident, in the case of an argument, in the case of a knife fight. It can do that. That's how powerful this is. So when the person, these things are happening, these different uh, distractions are coming up, don't think little of them and look carefully at your mind and see if you are at the level where you can give an affirmation of I will sit without sloth and torpor and go back and sit, smile, laugh it off that it came, always give a little smile and let it go, relax, smile and come back to sitting without sloth and torpor and start again before you give up to get up and start trying to walk back and forth and get more energy it might be that all you need to do is just communicate better with your mind. So all of the training is about a form of communication with the mind. I considered thus, whenever recluses and Brahmins who are overcome with restlessness and unpeaceful in their minds resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified, overcome with uh, restlessness and unpeaceful in their minds, but when I sit in the forest as one of the noble ones, I sit there with a peaceful mind. And seeing in myself the purity of peaceful mind, I find great solace in dwelling in the forest. So the key to this is looking to the opposite first and checking it out. If you can do that very quickly in your sitting, that's just fine. The moment you see this, any one of these distractions, the moment you see them, that you're recognizing that it's happening. And you're recognizing usually a different level of tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Very slight sometimes, but it's there. And that's where you come to the dislike of the restlessness and unpeaceful mind. Now, restlessness and unpeaceful mind is simply a case of I don't like it. So your craving, remember your definition of your craving, your craving always manifests. That means it always comes up the same way by a change in the level of tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. If you spot that, you will see that what's driving that dislike is I, I am. And the I, I don't like it, is popping up and causing the pressure for the tension and the tightness. So what do you do? You do your six R's. In each one of these cases, sloth and torpor, okay? Before you do anything, you do your six R's. You recognize there's this distraction and it's restlessness and an unpeaceful mind. You let it go, you just let it go. Let it fall away, relax your head, smile, and come back to what? You come back to having a peaceful mind in place of it. So your smile is the very first part of the um, uplifted mind. When you let go, relax, your smile is the first step of the wholesome, bringing up the wholesome. But then the fulfilling of the wholesome in this case, he's saying, I have a peaceful mind. So he's setting up an affirmation. I'm sitting with a peaceful mind. And he smiles into it and he sits with it very quietly. And that's what he's doing, coming back with the contradiction on the wholesome side. 
Okay, the next one is whenever recluses and Brahmins resort to their remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, owing to the defect of uh, uncertainty and doubting. And doubt's a big one. Doubt is picking up when you don't get what you think should be happening in your practice. At that point, you start doubting the training. But remember, you have to stick with the instructions exactly. And if you're working with a guide, what good are we? Well, basically, we're the ones that point and we point. When you report to us, we catch what's in between the lines or what you said point blank to us. You might say something like, you know, I tried to let it go and then I came right back. Well, that's not the six R's. It's pretty simple. If you don't do all the steps, they are that serious, just like the ingredients, six ingredients of a cake. You know, I put it in the oven, but I didn't put the butter in it and I don't understand it, it didn't come out. <laughs> Another one, you know, is putting it in without the baking soda involved or the baking powder, if it calls for it in the cake recipe. And a good one is not putting the egg in. Well, I didn't have an egg, so I thought I'd just put it in the oven and see what happens. It didn't work out so well. So doubting is caused by you not getting what you want and you fall into our uncertainty about maybe this just isn't right. Maybe I should be doing something else. Maybe And most of it, what I want, see a lot of times is I see people quit trying to do this loving kindness practice and go back to the breath. Now they weren't progressing on the path when they were doing the breath before. They were getting doing, doing the breath okay. And they were able to sit sometimes even for hours, but nothing ever changed. And the big one for them was that it might not have changed in life about the hindrances. Nothing's changing, nothing's really calming down in life. I'm very calm. I hear people say all the time, got back from the retreat, I was very calm. I managed to sit for even two, three hours at the retreat. Coming home, um, everything sort of comes back to the way it was before. One lady said to me, well, it's almost over. And tomorrow we get to go back into the belly of the beast. She was referring to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and when she goes back into Washington, D.C. and she goes back to work, well, nothing changes. Still same problems in the office, you know, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a little while too, because I have somebody that did something really terrific this week. I want to share with you what happened to the development in her practice, because it's very special to me that this happened I was very excited about the, the progress in what was happening in her life outside of the meditation and work in the, in the uh, lockdown situation where she's living. So doubting is a hard one. And he, when he was sitting, he went and he sat down. I resort as one of the noble ones into the, to the jungle thicket resting places in the forest with my mind that has gone beyond doubt. I have gone beyond doubt. He has set doubt aside. And it has to do, what is the cancellation of doubt? What do you suppose that is? Probably faith. Faith that this can work. And so when you have doubt, the contradiction is to have faith. If I go back to the recipe, Sister Kama says, you know, it'll probably work if you just follow the blending instructions and the steps or ingredients of the recipe. I bet, I bet it will work. The next one is that the recluses and Brahmins unpurified in bodily conduct resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest and owing to the defect of their minds because they are given to self-praise and disparagement of others, 
These good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. Given to self-praise and disparagement of others in my mind, I am not given to self-praise or to disparagement of others. I, he simply goes there and he says, seeing in myself this purity, where I am not given to such self-praise or disparagement of others, I find great solace in dwelling in the forest. The next one is that when the recluses and Brahmins um, with, uh, subject, have subject, are subject to alarm and terror. And what does this mean? It means they're not in the fourth jhana yet. <laughs> they haven't touched this equanimity element where things just, if you actually taste, listen closely, if you actually experience equanimity, nothing will disturb you when you are in equanimity. So when you're working in equanimity, there's no reason to come out of it for anything because nothing's disturbing you. And certainly if something happens, you're going not understanding what equanimity is. Equanimity is um, a complication in hearing about it in modern meditation teachings. I try to question Bhante what exactly is equanimity compared to indifference. And I wanted him to explain, oh, he was funny. He said, it's just easy. Don't have to talk a lot. <laughs> Equanimity has perfect mindfulness, perfect observation, attention, interest. You're perfectly working with whatever object that you're working with. Okay, perfect mind. Remember mindfulness by our definition. Mindfulness is the observation power itself, a skilled observation power that is used in meditation. Meditation is defined as observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how everything works. And if we want to go one step further, define it a little further, a few more words, we would say, uh, we want to see how everything works, but we want to fully understand the Four Noble Truths. Okay, the Four Noble Truths Dependent origination, at least those seven links that we give you to practice with, from contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual reaction tendency, and birth of reaction, we, just those seven pieces are critical for you to understand and learn how to watch. So you want to be able to understand the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics of existence, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. What is anicca? Anicca is change, is happening all the time. Everything is changing. So why get upset if you have a flat tire? Because eventually you won't have a flat tire anymore. <laughs> you have to take a little bit of humor in life that happens. Like yesterday, I was sitting there counseling a student innocently on my desk. I had the whole day planned my packing, everything. And then my foot was up on the footrest under the desk, you know, and I put my foot down and it splashed. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? There's a half inch of water in my whole bedroom. <laughs> well, the, the washing machine, the pipe had popped out and we had a flood. And I was just laughing like a little kid. And I said, I gotta go now, I gotta start mopping. <laughs> And then people came in from the neighborhood and started helping me clean up. It was kind of funny. But there was this thing, and it was like, there's nothing to do here except laugh about it. You, you've always got a choice, okay? But when we go back to the equanimity and the, uh, my, and the, the um, uh, right, indifference, and we can say a feeling of in, just you're indifferent. The 
equanimity has perfect mindfulness, means perfect observation and patience watching what's going on and nothing is disturbing you and you understand anicca, dukkha and anatta. What are the anicca, dukkha, anatta? One is impermanence or change is going on all the time. The dukkha is the suffering, okay? The dukkha is the suffering and the last part is anatta. And anatta, <laughs> anatta, I always giggle because I never could figure out why, what is anatta in the same group as anicca, dukkha, anatta? The Buddha was really smart. This was a simple thing. Change really bothers you. It causes you suffering. And the way out of it is to just take it all impersonally. Don't take it personally at all. And remember anicca, even though it causes you to have suffering, Anicca can turn out to be your friend. And many of the students right now are telling me that this is their friend because if they remember this Anicca, and we told them they should make little, little, um, make little uh, flags, like, you know, sports flags like this is say Anicca on a yellow background, Anicca. And the first time you get mad or you start getting, hey, come on, Anicca, we can talk a little bit here or get mad for a couple seconds, but there's no point in it because whatever arises passes away and you can settle things much easier if you just let things go. And this is helping a lot of people. You know, this was happening to me and this person was getting mad at the office, they'll tell me, and they started getting criticizing me again and everything, but this time I just stood there and I kind of went, uh-huh, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, you're probably exactly right. I didn't even say probably, you're right. Uh-huh, you're right. Mm -hmm. And they walked away. And then it was gone. What happened? Anicca happened. It changed, you see? So don't get so upset with things. It's, it's much easier to let it go and smile and come back and keep doing what you're doing in the present time. And, you know, the person that was upset probably is more upset with themselves than they are with you. And that's what we keep forgetting about. Usually if somebody's yelling at you, they're actually yelling at themselves. They're not yelling at you. So the best thing is to go get ice cream or go get tea and talk about what's really going on in your life, what's going on in mine. And maybe you find out something happened last weekend that got them really upset or some situation is there that are having trouble with. It's not you. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. The person needs a little bit of compassion 80% of the time right now, I think that's true with COVID, and I think it's true with the living situations. So the next one here was the person is subject to alarm and terror, and they're having problems with fear and dread in the forest because they're trying to sit with a mind that is subject and falls right into alarm and terror. Well, they're not, they haven't got the equanimity because if they had the equanimity, they wouldn't jump. The heart doesn't jump, the stomach doesn't move and the brain goes right to, okay, what is essentially going on here in the dark that just went bump? What is it? But they don't jump into alarm and terror and shock. That's the person that doesn't have any of this equanimity. So when the Buddha is sitting in the forest, he's telling us, I resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones, free from trepidation and trepidity and trepidation. If you're trepid, your, your trepidity is your shaking and the first part of surface level of going into shock. So rather than do that, I always go back to the story, my own story about trepidity and this sort of thing with alarm and terror when the tree fell on me. And you all know that the tree fell on me by now. <laughs> the tree took two guys to pull it, lift it up and get it off me. When the tree hit me, I, I'm lucky because I had a hard hat on. And um, the tree came back the wrong way and came down after I started cutting a second tree. And the person said, look out, instead of move, they said, look, look out. Well, I jumped right up and when I stood up, it went right down the front of me and pinned me to the ground. 
laying there unconscious and coming in and out of consciousness is what was happening to me. And it never occurred to me to get scared because this one student was over me, he looked down and he says, what do I do now? <laughs> Which was, uh, it made me want to laugh because we all knew that this one person didn't know what they should do. This person is, may they rest in peace, but you know, they did not, they did not ever know quite what to do. And I said, go and get the monk and bring him back. And then I passed out again. And this experience of going in and out of consciousness was fascinating uh, because I couldn't feel my legs and I didn't jump into the future. What am I going to do? What if I can't walk? What if I can't drive? Oh my gosh, you know, I didn't do that. I took it as an opportunity. After all, I wasn't going anywhere and I was absolutely still. I may as well look at my whole body and see what's going on. So Bhante came and comes down with the person who wanted the monk to run, but the monk walked down and got down there and, and he stood over me and he looked down at me and said what he says to you every time you go into an interview. He said, how's it going? <laughs> I looked up and I said, please don't make me laugh. And I just gave him a report about my neck and my arms and the pain and the distal point of the pain, how far it was going and what was happening. And then he decided that they would lift the tree off. And then they lifted me and took me back to the, uh, to the trailer. And I, I stayed there for 45 minutes. And I, I thought, there's nothing wrong. I need a hot shower and I need to go back to work. And I went back out and continued working in the afternoon. No broken bones, just this experience of equanimity for real, you see? And so indifference is different than that. So these are not the same. Indifference still your digestive system, your heartbeat rate, your breathing rate, everything increases and happens. And indifference is just, I really don't care about this, but you still get disturbed. So these are different levels of this uh, in the equanimity. The next one was uh, that if a monk goes into the forest to the remote jungle thicket resting places and he is desirous of gain and honor and renown, he's in trouble. <laughs> That's what he's thinking about when he's going into his meditation. It's not it's not going to work. And all kinds of thoughts and imaginations and stories are going to come up in your mind. I knew someone once who said the only reason they were interested in, um, in coming into the monastic system was uh, as a legacy, to have a legacy. In other words, to have a statue and have everybody remember them and that sort of thing. And basically they didn't stay. They ended up leaving. They were not happy with it because it was not a good reason. There are other suttas that tell us these are not the good reasons for coming in. And so when the Buddha sat in the forest, the contradiction to this one was he had few wishes. And what do I tell you? The best mindset for you is when you are going into your meditation, no matter where you're sitting, every single meditation will be different. Not one of them will be the same size or the same shape. But also I tell you the right mindset. What was Sariputta's mindset? When he is in 111, you should go read it and figure it out sometime. What exactly was his mindset when he went into his meditation and was able to Watch everything happen in each level that he passed through. He sat only to see what happens next. That's what he did. He sat only to see what happens next. And I often tell you this is the mind of a two or three-year-old child. 
And if you don't believe me, you need to go to a nursery school and get permission just to watch the kids, you know, and see how children handle curiosity. Very different from us as an adult. When we're looking at something, we have established an encyclopedia and they're just beginning to build a dictionary and the first volume of their encyclopedia. So they're always curious. Their curiosity is a pure, clean kind of curiosity. There is no restriction on them on style and shape and design. They're gonna paint a tree that's purple and make it have orange leaves. And I almost fired a kindergarten teacher one time who told my, me that she thought there was a problem with my son because he was creating a tree the wrong color and the leaves were the wrong color. And I looked at her strange and I said, haven't you ever been to an art museum? You have to go and look at some art exhibits and expand the innovation in your mind. Maybe it, for him, there was a painter called Muir, M-U-I-R. You can look it up sometime. It's a modern art portion of the, uh, one of the um, museums, Jefferson Museum in Washington, DC. And when I saw this man was a famous artist, his painter, Paint, his paintings and drawings were selling for half a million or a million dollars. He was drawing the same way as an eight-year-old child. And they took it. And why not? Because of the message he was giving in these drawings and paintings. It was wonderful to find that after that had happened years before with my son. All right. The next one is you sit and you are lazy and wanting in energy. You are not energetic enough. And this can happen if you're honestly tired when you are sitting. If you get up and uh, you start um, walking and you are still sluggish and you examine how much you slept, you're not suited for short hours. Many people are not suited for short hours. This is something we develop in our training, and at one point, I only needed four hours of sleep. Now, as I got older, this changed, but I partially think that's because I got older. But if I'm sitting on a steady basis, I can go back to four or five hours. But I had doctors tell me I would not, I would cease to exist if I didn't sleep for 10 hours because of an accident I had. And it wasn't necessary. This is all having to do with mind-body connection, you see? And you can get down to a few hours, but it's not something you should be pushed to do at all. And one of the things that we believe about people being able to move quickly down the line of progress, the, down the path with full, complete understanding is that our retreats are set up so that you have seven and a half hours of sleep every day. So when you come to Damasuka, you're not going to, there's not going to be any um, sleep deprivation ideas. You, many people leave completely rested, very happy, very open-minded, really understanding how the Dhamma applies to their life. They go home and they start having fun and applying it and using it all the time. I like to teach, I used to teach when I was um, when, uh, teaching online, I got involved with um, lawyers and doctors and judges, <laughs> you know, and these people really, really work and press the hours. But I taught them how to do power sitting and I taught them how to get two hours of sleep by sitting a particular way for 20 minutes. And I taught them things that had to do with meditation to clear their mind. And most of what was going on for them was they were carrying around the past from the morning or the day before or jamming themselves up in their schedule. And, and they were worried about what was coming next too much. And they didn't have a present time bubble that was clear and strong. And every human being has enough energy for one full 24 hour period and enough for you to do everything you need to do. But if you keep loading into your head, your past issues and your future issues, 
then it gets too heavy to work with, too crowded, and you can't have clear thought. And that's one of the things we teach you about um, Jimenekaya number one, uh, 131, 32, 33, and 34, the, the same sutta repeated four times. The only place this happens verbatim in that book, in the Majima Nikaya. And what's it about? The past, the future, and the present lesson. It's worth your time to go look at one of our, uh, our um, you know, recordings that has this lesson on it. It's really worth it. The next one is when you, when he goes to sit, he is energetic. He makes a determination. He's going into his sitting energetic. And so you can bet he's not walking slowly and he's walking for energy. And the slow walking that is in modern times, it did, you know, we, we can only speak about the Mahasi tradition, but Mahasi himself, Venerable Mahasi did not walk slowly. He had a 35 foot long strip by his cootie and uh, the monks have told me that he walked swiftly. But after he passed away, they made this change and the slow walking became a style. But what happens is the people who are walking slow don't have enough energy and good circulation in their body to get to the longer sitting. And so it doesn't happen. And so this is one of the things, you know, this has a direct effect on you having enough walking, enough uh, exercise in order to keep your circulation going so that you don't have problems when you sit long. Okay, the next one is um, unmindful and not fully aware. If you go into it and you are unmindful and not fully aware, why would that be? Well, you're thinking about your mother-in-law coming tomorrow and you have to clean the house and you need to, you're thinking all about that or something else. If you're unmindful and not able to do your observation properly, you're not fully aware. And there are many reasons, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, low circulation, um, not having being clear with your interviews sometimes that we can't uncover quite what it is. If you're too much energy, uh, too much um, uh, concentration, you will run into situations where you get a headache and you, uh, you have a headache and you have tinnitus and sometimes you have um, vertigo where you're wobbly when you get up, you're wobbly walking. This isn't because you're older, this is happening basically uh, because of this. The next condition is he sits in the forest unconcentrated with straying minds. And I am, uh, he decides to go in, instead he decides to go in with possessed with concentration. I would say possessed with productive level of concentration. We have to get a clear understanding about concentration and we call it collectedness to try to tone it down. But the most important thing for us is to understand that the concentration has to be at a particular level in order for clear observation to be happening. But there don't, you have to relax your face and keep smiling helping a lot, helps a great deal for the level of concentration to come into a productive level. Then you have, I'm unconcentrated with a straying mind. And he says, I am possessed of a productive concentration. And that's where you have the right amount, not too tight and not too loose, but just right. And if I were to show you this with my hands, I say not too closed and tight like this, not just gone and too open, but just so it's like this so that you can watch inside what is actually happening, okay? And I considered this whenever recluses and Brahmins devoid of wisdom who are dribblers and resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom, 
and drivelers, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. Now, this one is interesting because devoid of wisdom, basically in our tradition, what we teach you is that devoid of wisdom means that you do not clearly understand the dependent origination and how to use it, okay? And this is what we call the wisdom because um, in order to understand how craving arises, how it exists, how it passes away, you have to have an understanding of human cognition and how this happens. We're making sure that you have the proper knowledge to be able to understand how that works. And then you can see very clearly, uh, and person in his taints, you hear this expression, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. What did it mean? His taints were destroyed because he could see precisely, essentially, what was going on and have the right mind state, let go of anything that was unwholesome, keep what was wholesome and continue to practice. And he was practicing his six R's and this whole entire sutta is basically saying to you, it won't work like this. So when this happens, you let go of it, you relax, you smile, and you come back to what you're doing. And you bring up the contradictory, the contradiction to the, what was unwholesome. You bring up the wholesome side. So purified, they're using purified and unpurified in this sutta. But I do not resort to the remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest devoid of wisdom, a driveler, I am possessed of wisdom and I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones possessed of wisdom who is fully knowledgeable of how everything is operating. Seeing in myself this possession of wisdom, I find great solace in dwelling in the forest. Now the next paragraphs, two paragraphs are really kind of interesting. We're at section 20 of the sutta. And in this one, uh, in explaining the, it's explaining when you have your celebrations and the most important times of the month on the 10 month calendar, it's explaining the moon calendar. I considered thus, there are the specially auspicious nights of the 14th and 5th, the 15th, and the, um, the eighth of the fortnight. And what if on such nights as these, I were to dwell in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines. And they're basically talking also about cemeteries. Perhaps I might enter an uh, encounter fear and dread, and later on such specially auspicious nights as the 14th or the 15th and the 8th of the fourth night, I dwelt in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes, orchard shrines, woodland shrines, tree shrines, cemeteries. And while I dwelt there, a wild animal would come up to me, or a peacock would knock off a branch, or the wind would rustle the leaves, and I thought, what now? If this is the fear and dread that is coming, I thought, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping the same posture as I am, as I'm in when it comes upon me? In other words, what if I just don't move and witness Anicca, witness the branch breaking and falling and just then it's gone? What if I do that? And also, um, he asked the question here, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? And this goes to another sutta. When we look in section, uh, it's sutta number eight, 19, okay? And we see this statement, he's talking to the monks and he's, uh, he's telling the monks in the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta,
Whoever thinks, whenever you're, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders on, that will become the inclination of the mind. And you've heard that many times when we've been teaching you. So if you let your mind slip into, oh, what if this happens? Maybe I should get up. Maybe I should move. Maybe I should go sit somewhere else. Why? Just stay there. You create this fear. He's getting to this here. While I walked, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither stood nor sat nor lay down till I had subdued the fear and the dread. So until he went through the anicca, the pattern of anicca, and he saw it, and then he stopped worrying about it. But gradually he figures out when I stood, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor sat nor lay down until the fear and dread was subdued. And while I sat, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor lay down until the, it, I had subdued the fear and dread. While I lay down, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor sat down until I had subdued the fear and dread. This is before he knew about the food of the hindrances and the abandoning. He's not talking about that here. The food of the hindrance is my personal attention. And the way to subdue a hindrance is not to press it or try to stop it, but to let it go and allow it to go through the process of a Nietzsche. This is a good example of a piece of knowledge that makes it so you don't have to get repeatedly upset and stop it, okay? Because once you understand there is a law for your hindrances, and that is your personal attention makes it get bigger and stronger and stay there longer. There are Brahmins, some recluses and Brahmins perceive day when it is night and night as it is day, they're mixed up. <laughs> I say that on their part, this is an abiding in delusion. They're thinking too much about that. But I perceive night when it is night and day when it is day. He's clear in his perception of day and clear in his perception of night. It really doesn't matter to him either. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many out of compassion for the world, for the good, the welfare and happiness of gods and humans. It is me indeed, the rightly speaking, this should be said. Tireless energy aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and it was untroubled. My mind was concentrated and unified. Unified just means we put too much emphasis on unified. Doesn't mean unified. It means unified in purpose of doing your meditation, not letting go, following through. And then he starts to talk about using the jhanas while he's in the forest to stabilize himself, okay? Quite secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana accompanied by thinking and examining thoughts with joy and happiness born of seclusion. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought entered upon and abided the second jhana which has self-confidence and a singleness of mind clear of, clear of what you're doing, very clear with applied and sustained thought with joy and happiness born of concentration. You see how the equanimity is starting to get calmer and, and happier, uh, stabler, more and stabler. And with the fading away as well of joy, I abided in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body I entered upon, abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, who has a pleasant abiding, 
who has equanimity and is mindfulness. So here he is, he's still feeling the body and he's in the third jhana. Then with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the preparation, um, the uh, previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So here he is. He is in a state now where he stabilizes. Equanimity has surfaced. He's not afraid of anything now. Whatever comes up, be assured. He knows when he has real equanimity, he knows, or a teacher tells you, you're, you're secure enough now that you can be prepared for recalling of past lives. So now what's happening, he's going to recall past lives is what he did. When my concentrated mind was purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, undisturbability, could not be disturbed. I directed it to the knowledge of recollection of past lives. Now this, this is one of the ways to, to reach Nibbana and you can, uh, you can go this avenue. Usually a teacher will advise you if you need, you, you seem to have the tendency to be going in that direction and we support you to do it or um, you might start doing it and we might say, try this first before you get involved in that because you're in a retreat mostly. But once you start, if, if you're falling towards this naturally, I, he, what happened to him, I recollected my manifold past lives. That is one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, 1,000 births, 100,000 births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. And there I was so named of such a clan each time with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was so named of such a clan and such an appearance, such was my nutriment such my experience, pleasure and pain, such my life term, passing away from there, I reappeared again. And there with these aspects and particulars, I reconnected my manifold past lives. What good is this? What good is this? And what happens is you realize the statement, heirs of our actions. We are heirs of our actions by this experience of going through the past lives. Now, this has only been a few people Bhante's known in all the time he's been teaching and one uh, person did several world systems. So just briefly to tell you what this means, and I don't have my pencil with me, I forgot it. But when I put up a, you know, whiteboard for you, Basically what this is, is he is confirming the comma confirmation of the comma, comma system, how it works. But he's, anything he sees, anything he experiences, he knows it's not real. He's grounded. He's very clear in his mind. And he's just letting these things come in and go out and come in and go out and come in and go out. He is not sitting or storing them up to think about. So you can't do that anyway. If you are in equanimity, it just floats through and you move, you live in the present moment, just like this, not there and not there. Nothing stays in your head. You live the present time really clearly. So he did this. Now this, this length of time they're talking about here, um, the Buddha has a system of time in Buddhism. And it's come, interestingly enough, it matches up with what the Science Institute figured out the beginning of the universe was. I was delighted when I went to this science museum with my kids and it matched what I was being taught in Buddhism. I was delighted with it. So 
you have this tiny little thing the size of my thumbnail and it explodes and this is the expansion of the universe. And this one expansion happens for so many millions of years and then it stops. And when it stops, it rests out on the edge like this and that's for the same length of time. And then it, com it comes down and it contracts all the way back down into that tiny thing again, and then it rests again for both equal times. This is humongous, this is huge. So when MIT came out at this thing about the creation of the universe, well, I was shocked to find out they were talking about the expansion and the contraction and the resting points and everything was right there. So we're right on, you know, right on the money. You know, we've got it just right there, very, very nice. Okay, this was the true, first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. And the ignorance was banished, the true knowledge arose, darkness was banished, the light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. And it is, it's very, very eye-opening when you experience even one or two of these lifetimes. And some of you know, I've told you, there's been studies done about the recollection of past lives in relationship to the elimination of phobias, okay? And the reason I did it was because of a sudden fear that came when I was 51 years old, and it was a fear of heights. And I never had it in my whole life until I was 51 years old. Bonte encouraged me at that, that year that, that that happened in the summertime, in the beginning of summer. And it all happened because he sent me on the roof with a big spoon and told me to clean out the, <laughs> clean out the rain gutters. And when I got on the roof, I was terrified and my legs locked up and I turned gray. And he says, I'm holding the ladder. You can come down now. So I did. <laughs> but I was really confused and scared and didn't know why. And I didn't know what I was gonna do with the work I was doing in the woods every day by myself. It was uh, pretty shocking. So anyway, we went through this recall of past lives and I only went as far as four or five lifetimes. And in each case, I didn't get involved with the clan, the family, the name, what you're eating, everything like that. I didn't do that. I only wanted to see where these people were, if they existed. And the people that were there were five different women, 51 or 52 years old. I found out that much. I arrived on the day they were dying. And the way that they died was one fell off a house, one fell off a wall, one fell off a mast of a ship and was killed. One fell off a cliff and the other one fell into a crevice in the pasture. And basically I said, okay, that's enough. What did I mean? Well, my report to Vanti basically was that this, this sphere has nothing to do with me in this life. If I can go 50 years climbing 30 and 40 foot trees and building tree stands in trees, and working in the forest the way I did a lot of times in my life. Why would this suddenly come upon me? It doesn't have to do with this life. It's something kicking back. And I didn't want to dissect it, but I was very happy to go on the roof after that and clean everything. <laughs> no problem. So that's an example of what they're talking about. These psychologists are writing books now about how this is true and how this is actually helping people with phobias. And it wasn't anything to do with me. Uh, there's just a couple books out there that are pretty interesting. When my concentrated mind, he says, was purified, bright, unblemished, and rid of imperfections, in other words, rid of me paying attention to a hindrance pulling me away. When that's over, I'm rid of imperfections. My, my mind is malleable, wieldy, steady, attained to just watching inside and perturbability. I directed it to the knowledge of passing away and the reappearance of beings. 
this was because I did that. Monty encouraged me to try this out. <laughs> and I did it just to find out whether there was really hell and it existed or not. This is what the experiment was. And so with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior, superior, fair and ugly, fortunate, unfortunate, understood, he understood how beings pass on according to their actions. These worthy beings were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind. And if they were revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions on the dissolution of the body, okay, after death, they have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, or even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in their body, speech, and mind, and not revilers of the noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death, reappeared in good destinations and even in a heavenly world. And thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their actions, which was a second true knowledge attained by me. In the middle watch of the night, ignorance was banished, true knowledge arose, darkness was banished, light arose, happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. So you can do this. You can actually do it. You have to work for a period of time. Uh, with Bhante's really good working on steadying your practice, but the way you do it is to continue to lengthen your practice and you keep practicing a little bit. To, people say, how do you sit longer? Well, you start by adding five minutes when you want to get up. And then you say to your mind, look, I'm only going to do it five minutes more. That was 10 minutes. <laughs> and then you get up and take a walk and exercise and then come back if you're sequestering to practice extensively and get longer sittings. So you gradually get it up. It's very common in our retreats, online retreats or on residential retreats for people to come in and start uh, at and start at only um, you know, 30 minutes of sitting. And by the time they leave the retreat in nine days, they can be up to two hours, they can be up to three hours. It all comes down to who, who progresses faster, the one who follows the directions and only the directions very, very carefully. and doesn't change anything or add or subtract anything to the instructions. That's what we figured out, okay? What is this? You got me, but it's working for people. And that's all I can tell you. Everything is like, where is the Buddha's original practice? Who knows? It's 2,600 years later. The only thing anyone can say about any practice is if you're sitting and you're getting what you need, and that's why you were sitting to get that. If it's just rest, relaxation, less stress, that sort of thing, that's fine. You know, there's all different reasons people sit in meditation. But if you want to know what happened and what Godema actually did, you're looking for something that is described perfectly in the text. And that's what we're trying to teach you. That's all we're trying to teach you. What was it? Sandatiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Viditabo, Niwiti. That's what it was. Easy to understand immediately effective here and now that you would understand how you're progressing and it feels better. The relief feels better. So easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection. And that's sort of where they say, come and see. You want to come and see deeper. You're curious now. You wanna know how deep the rabbit hole goes and how far you can actually understand things, all right? So it's easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection, untouched by time. He was promised it would be untouched by time. And it is. 
but you have to go back to precisely what the directions were and let go of everything else. He tells you this in 72 in section 18. He tells it to you in 29 section something else, 10, I think. Same thing, that you cannot learn this by, um, by just books and just trying to do it by mixing all kinds of things up or following different teachers all over the place. We don't know how it happened, but the, the marker today is they're really great if you can say you had six teachers. And unfortunately for me, well, actually, fortunately for me, I met the patriarch of the Bangladesh group in outside of Washington, DC. When I first started with Bonte at the Washington Temple and the patriarch looked at me and he says, you really want to do this? And he pulls his glass and he says, if you really want to do this, the problem for the Westerner is they can't stay with one teacher. They cannot, they don't have the discipline to do it. Can you stay with one teacher? Well, I guess so, it's been 20 years. <laughs> but it's because the only reason I'm still here is because it works. And because I can help people get free from the troubles and things that they're facing in life by applying the right effort properly and using that plus the knowledge of how everything's operating. And then I can tell you whether it's poor progress or excellent progress based on what the Buddha said in Sutta number 28, section 10 in the Digga Nikaya, where he had the modes of progress and he explained them. Okay, the second true knowledge was done that way. And the next one, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, and rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to the imperturbability, high level of equanimity. I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So there are your four noble truths. That's the first thing he realized. And the path that he was using for his investigation is confirmed in the Samyutta Nikaya that he used the four noble truths for his investigative framework in his own meditation. Then he says, I directly knew as it actually is, these are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, the cessation of taints. I directly knew as it actually is, the way leading to the cessation of the taints. Right effort is the way these steps were showing you. And each time you do it, you can feel the lightness of your mind and you can feel the clarity and how it's working to open up your mind step by step. And when I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being. And we say that when it says the taint of being, it means from the taint of reactions, all your reactions stop. You only now respond. When you come away, you only respond. You don't react based on stuff from the past anymore. It's gone. When it was um, the, the taint of being and from the taint of ignorance, when it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. No more reacting, no more yelling back. Observation, patience, loving kindness, forgiveness. This was the third noble true knowledge Attained in me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, true knowledge arose, darkness was banished, and light arose, as happens in one who abides, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Now, Brahman, it might be that you think perhaps today, that perhaps the recluse Gotama 
is not free from lust, hate, and delusion, even today, which is why he still resorts to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. But you should not think thus. It is because I see two benefits that I will resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. I see a pleasant abiding for myself here and now. And I have compassion for the future generations. And we can find out how this works. And we can learn there's a way. The reality, what is the impact of the reality of what he's saying? You, nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. You actually create your experience each day. You decide. You're in charge. And yes, there is a you that does that and volitionally chooses to crave or not to crave, to cling or not to cling. That is the Buddhist question. We should have a Shakespeare play about that. You really should. <laughs> and then you have the statement, the stock statement at the end of the sutta, which is always fun. Indeed, it is because Master Gotama is accomplished. This is Genesoni now. He's talking to the Buddha. Gotama is the accomplished one, a fully enlightened one, that he has compassion for future generations. Magnificent, Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what has been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost and holding up the lamp in the dark for those with eyesight enough to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. And it's like he made it all clear. He's the one, he's the man. He's the one that did it and he is a man. And you're a man or a woman. And as a human being, you can do it too. That's the best part, best part. So I'm gonna throw it open for questions. I'm not gonna to talk to you much because I tend to feel it's important to be talking to you through this because of the ins and outs of the meanings of things. Instead of reading it straight through and trying to cover it afterwards because I feel to listen to it. There are other, other ones you can listen to others who are doing it straight through and that's good. But a lot of you, you don't have a lot of vocabulary when I'm teaching and it's not fair to talk about mental proliferation or cognition or many, many other words and have expect you to understand unless we're showing you how it's all hooked together as we go through step by step. This is just me. The, they, they say Mataji. <laughs> it's the Mataji doing this, all right. So any questions? Who's got questions about this one? Hmm? You basically had 16 different things coming up. And it all works the same. When we looked at this to try to establish once, were there laws that were guiding meditation? Was there a set of laws, like a laws of physics, laws of mathematics, laws that were unbreakable, un you cannot violate them? We came up with a group of those. We can talk about them another time, but we came up with eight or 10 of them, I think, 10 or 11, I think. And one of those was a Nietzsche. Whatever arises, passes away. We cannot change that. It's always going to be true with everything. And another one was that mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are all the states that happen. And this even goes further when we look at it medically because with mind, it affects the body and connects with the body. And I tell many people, you don't have to do tremendous long period of time relaxation exercises as much as lie down in bed and calm your mind and calm your mind and use sometimes listening to a dictation of calming the mind. And that calms the whole entire body enough to go to sleep and relax. 
but you're in charge more than you think you're in charge. And this also with craving and clinging is another place we get lost. Sometimes we think we cannot like or dislike anything. I'm sorry, you certainly can, and you can have a favorite food and you do have a personality and you, you can have fun or you can see something's not fun, but not get upset about it and understand a Nietzsche and let it go until it changes, you see? You have many, many choices, many, many, much more control than I ever believed in my teenage years. I was destroyed in my teenage years because I thought everything was on top of me, absolutely everything. And that's what happened. I drove my little car along the lifeline. I opened the trunk and every time I passed something, I put it in. <laughs> and then I started worrying about the future and I opened up the hood of the car in the front. I started packing things in there. Pretty soon the car wouldn't even steer. And that's really the definition of a breakdown, isn't it? Where nothing works. So you need to ask questions, anybody. I see the seas. <laughs> so anybody got one? Oh my gosh, what time is it? So it's eight, eight o'clock, right? Is that, is that right? It's eight o'clock. Okay. So what are you up to, Ulysses? Ask me a question. <laughs> I... Um, well, this is more of a confirmation, you know, what you went through today with the hindrances, but also going back to the Anicca part, because in the, you know, I, I tried to apply this to the daily living because this is where it's useful for me, like day to day, the, the daily grind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are two aspects to that, you know, like you said, the I like and I don't like, and when I, uh, and, and, the, and the beautiful thing about it is, uh, the fact that if you understand that everything just passes by, that even if you like something, you understand that you like it in the moment and you don't have to expect for that to repeat again. It doesn't have to be something that needs to be repeated. And the same thing happens with when something you don't like or you feel unhappy about, um, you know that it will go away. It, it'll eventually has to, it'll eventually has to end. So you're not you, you don't have to live in the same cycle of like, I am, you know, I'm going down this path where I'm, you know, breaking that, breaking apart. That, that, that doesn't happen anymore because the actions sort of happens in the present and then that's it. That's, that's, that's right, that's right. When I went to look up the word, um, I don't have a dictionary here, I can't do it, but if you go and look up the word alive, go and look up the word alive. And there's going to be a mention in one of the definitions, if you have a large, a large dictionary, you're going to find um, in one of the definitions for the word alive is the word life continuum. I found that interesting because when I teach you the past and the future and the present, I show you the little highway going along like this and here you were born and here you're gonna eventually die and you're moving along this little highway in a little car, okay? And the only place you are alive is in the car. You are not alive in the past anymore, are you? And you are not alive in the future yet. You can't be, it's not here. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know what's going to happen. To keep our sanity, we are here now. This was Ram Dass's be here now structure. Be here now, he said. And it was very important for people to get it. Be here. This is real. It doesn't mean what happened in the past is not worth anything. You learn from it. You store the you know, problem, solution, problem, solution in information. It doesn't mean you should never spend time on the future. You can take this present moment and we can talk about our daughter's next five years plan for college if we want to. We're talking about the future, but then that's what we did in this 
present time. And then we let it go and we started working with life. But if we could just learn to take that backpack off our back and put it down, the one that is full of past regrets or past grudges or past want, desires for revenge, all this stuff from something that happened that's now frozen in time back here. It's frozen. It is fixed in time. It is finished. The energy of the event is gone. And so we keep wondering, you know, they were very smart about this. They had all the monks memorize that uh, first part of the prose that had to do with those suttas about the excellent night. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see. Insight is your discovery of how things work. Let him see each presently arisen state. How does it work? Dependent origination shows you how it works. Let him know that individual arising phenomena, how it operates. The origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger of it is taking you out of your car, <laughs> taking you out of the present time. That's the danger of it. And the escape from it was right effort. Looking at it, letting it go, relaxing, smiling, coming back. That's future. I don't have to worry about it right now. I'm not there. It doesn't mean don't plan for the future. If you have lots of information where you should store food right now, I advise you to store some food. They're already in most of the countries right now organizing the military in different locations in different countries to be aware there will be a food crisis. And it happens naturally after this kind of an epidemic we've had to deal with. We can get through it, but we have to keep our heads level. We have to stay balanced. And this training is teaching you how to let go of it. Now, I would share with you for just a moment I have a student who was working really hard at using stuff at home. And after she was trained in an online retreat, within two months time, it was like 60 days. And I got tickled by this because the new research says to change a habit, 66 days now, it takes 66 days you can change a habit, okay? My estimation was 12, 60 days with my students, okay, 60. Two month mark, she called me, excited because she had done this. She had really changed a habit of the way she looked at people and the way she was going to, she saw the reactions, she identified the reactions, she decided to watch this and you're watching the movie. What movie? It's called, we all call it the same thing. It's called in big flashy letters, My Life. <laughs> That's the name of the movie. And up to now, my life has had lots of adventures, reacting, reacting, emotionally disturbed, getting distressed, having depressions, having fights, arguing, yelling back, all this stuff in life. And then all of a sudden, somebody says, wait a second, wait a second. What was that all about? <laughs> and if you keep track of it in a little booklet, a little notebook, you're going to find out it was about something that happened 20 years ago, 10 years ago an attitude that somebody said something six years ago. It, it could be anything. It's really funny when you keep track of it. Look at this is the past, 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 past. Past can mean this morning <laughs> and you go to work and you're upset because there was something upsetting this morning. Or it can mean last year, it can mean other lifetimes, it can go on and on. So the first experience was that the reaction to the parents and the relatives in the house was changing because she, she was just deciding to do play yes with it. Yes, 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 because Anicca became very real and became her friend because she knew it always started, it happened and it had an end. 
So why not just say yes <laughs> and then get through it and then it's over. And that was the first approach. Now she's going to a new level. This is a very special level. And I would say this is now puts her at about this particular person. It puts her about four months out. And she had a genuine experience of what I call a genuine experience of sitting in what Christians would, Christian, we, in Christianity, we would say it's the opportunity of sitting in the God seat. The God seat is with God looking down, watching the whole play. And he has nothing to do with it, no stake in it. And he's not involved in it. It's totally nothing to do with him, but he can watch the whole thing. And she had a genuine experience of being there, watching what was happening when there was a dispute among four people in front of her. And it was exactly like a movie was playing in a movie house. And she wasn't involved in it at all, you see? This is where this takes you. It's where the practice takes you because then you're, you've got more knowledge now. What is essentially going on here? What is unessential? What is real? What is not real? What has to do with what's here right now? What's coming from the past and the future? Watching the movie and there's no effect at all. And it wasn't, uh, she could have very easily launched an opinion in the old days and been sucked into the play and pulled up out of the audience onto the stage. But you know what? The Buddha is showing you how to sit in the audience. He's giving you a way to understand it. You know, I traveled a lot with Fonti and I uh, <clears throat> really, it was interesting because I was a driver for him for a couple of years, a serious long distance driver, carrying him around the country to check out different temples and methods and all kinds of things in the United States. And I'm talking long driving, 18,600 miles in one year. And the next year it was 16,800 miles. Really funny when I looked at the odometer. And the thing of it is, you see a lot of strange things going on when you're going across the country and you start watching people. And he would, when we stopped in places, it just, you know, to, to have, uh, to eat lunch for me to get him lunch and say, when you sit down over there, watch around you what's happening, just watch. And you'll hear this happening. And it doesn't matter if you're watching around you in an airport in, in the concourse or in a very expensive lounge that somebody put you in. If you're in a palace listening to people talk or if you're in the gutters of humanity, the poorest people you can possibly dream up, the play, the script is all the same. And I hate to tell you, making a few hundred thousand years, uh, a few, a few hundred thousand dollars a year doesn't change your drama between your wife and husband and children and everything. It's in a box. It really is in a box. It's like a replay unit. So what you're learning about how to look at things very clearly, very clearly, and you can start with the things we say in the morning when we say our precepts, when we talk about the, the uh, reading the Dhammapada, why won't Bhante change those verses? He wants those six verses, two lines in each verse. He won't let us go to different ones because they are the vital ones. Seeing what is essential as essential and what is unessential as unessential. The person who can do that is able to watch the movie. And it was a shock to her. She's very observant. And she called and said, look at this. And I'm there. Anybody can learn to do this. You just have to keep track of it and watch how it's working. And then you do it. You start using this. You don't even intend to use it. I mean, when she came down the stairs, she honestly thought 
she didn't know whether to walk in the room or not. And when she walked in the room, there was no effect on her at all, none whatsoever. And I told her, this is first of all, one very important experience of equanimity, a very strong equanimity. That's how come this is happening. It's growing all the time inside you. You just keep reviewing it and listening to the suttas again and again and again. Why should I listen to a sutta more than once? <laughs> well, I've listened to them hundreds of times and I still pull out a new piece to try to show you in reference to what I know you need. You see, and it's stuff I haven't seen sometimes. I pull stuff out I haven't seen sometimes just by listening to Bonte teach it again. Hi, Sarah, you got one? You got a question? <laughs> <laughs> can, you hear me? can you hear me? No, I can. But shall I go? Shall I go? It's some, a practical question and around um, saying yes and saying no. And uh, specifically, I messed up yesterday. And I just, I just think it'd be interesting to hear what you would suggest um, to how to do things differently. So yesterday, I was saying no to my parents to try and protect them because it was my dad's birthday and they had a plan. They're quite old, they're 80, and they have a, had a plan to go to a restaurant. And I said, no, I said, and I, I suggested that I would go and visit them and I would see them from outside their house and they decided to go to a restaurant. And I said, no, quite a few times that I thought it was a mistake and that it wasn't a safe thing to do. And they told me they had a different opinion and it, it basically didn't go very well. But my, my motivation was around trying to keep them protected. It's not a very good time to be heading at their age into, into a restaurant. We have a vaccine that's weeks away for their age group and they chose to do it. And so it's left me feeling I, I failed basically. And also, um, yeah, it's not an easy thing for me to say uh, no, actually. Well, I don't know. I think you should have tied him up and taken him inside and gotten a good funny movie or something to watch. <laughs> no, no, the thing is, we, yeah. uh, we feel- It went very hysterical well, with this... my mom being really, really angry, which is the, which is the family pattern. If ever I would say anything contradictory. Question. Did they wear masks? Did they take Yeah, but they took them off. They took them off to eat, as you have to. Can you still hear, hear me? This is my new and, and the other thing, and the other thing is, you know, they they've been they've been shielding all of this time. What is this? <laughs> I traveled. See, I traveled to Pune. And I am the terror of any taxi that comes forward to me. <laughs> I them nearly at all. Since I've been here in over four weeks, I have not set foot out. I'm afraid Barat will come and get me. <laughs> Dr. Barat. <laughs> no, but just so you understand. When I was in Goa, we went through this because, you know, when Bonte and I arrived um, in Goa on March the 21st, the people in the check-in place by the, by the airplane, the, the jet, they wanted to take us directly to the hospital. <laughs> you know, and Bonte's in a wheelchair and I'm standing there and he's in a wheelchair. So we're gonna send you guys to the hospital. I said, what for? Well, they said, you have a condition. And I said, excuse me, I'm not sick and he's not sick. And we've just been doing eight retreats and toured India. And we have been very careful and we've always been sequestered, you know, in every situation we've been in, we're not sick. And she said, yes, but you, you don't quite understand. And, you know, she was holding this big, uh, this big thing up like this, you know, in front of her face, she was holding this up in, uh, in front of her face. And she was saying, you know, you don't quite understand, she said. You see, 
you have a condition. And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm over 70 and I had a physical, a really good one and there's nothing wrong with me at all. And I had a brain scan and a body scan and everything and there's nothing wrong with me, but you have, a con I said, okay, okay. What is our condition? And she said two words. Bonte was sitting in the, in the wheelchair at the time. And, he, and she said, you're old. I went, yeah, <laughs> okay, and what else? You know, you're old, that is your condition, you are old. And people are going bananas with this and it's gotten out of control, I admit. But the thing is, uh, you, can, you can be the terror of their neighborhood and buy one of these and get the small one for your hands with the aloe, it's nice. Make sure they have a breather mask, they have a little breathing hole so they're not fogged up. And then, you, yes, they can take their mask off and eat and they won't die. They really won't. And so if they have a good restaurant that's taking care of stuff now, probably they're going to be okay. You have to let go. You cannot fix them. You cannot mm -hmm. take the blame for their decision to do this. In the United States, this is really getting out of hand really, really getting out of hand. The police force is going against the governor in New York and in California and other states who say that we will not have Christmas. They want to take away the religion. They wanted only 10 people to be there for Thanksgiving when most of us have 20 or 30 people show up for Thanksgiving. There, this is really a crazy time, Sarah, you know? But people have their no. right to when, when make their decision. I wouldn't have done anything any different. I would have told them, look, this is how I feel about it. And then I would have gone out. I wouldn't have gone there unarmed. I would have gone in there with this. And I would have gone in there with a bottle of stuff for their hands and a brand new mask with a feel, you know, a hole in the side for breathing, which is great because then at least you can see because your glasses don't fog up anymore, you know. And then I would have wished them well, if you wanted to go with them, you would have, I would have jumped in and said, hey, listen, can I come too? I'll spray everything. I would have gone in there like a maniac and sprayed, I spray the whole entire cab. I will not get in the cab until I spray the seats and the backs of the seats and the doors and the handles. My taxi driver up in Goa, I bought this for him. He had to prepare the cab for me or Bet and I would not get in the cab to go to the food store. We can't go in the food store without getting sprayed. We can't go to the second floor without getting sprayed and go to the first floor again without getting sprayed. People are waking up, but- so what Would your suggestion be then that you would handle this by saying, all from a place of, I feel like this and I would rather something different happen. No, it's, it's the boundary. Between where do you say where do you say no and where do you say yes when it's a harming? Because my mum needs to shield; she has a condition. It's it's not just that they're old. This is um, just me. I'm just talking about me, and I'm and, not. Uh, and I understand. This, this is, I'm not saying the Buddha would say to be doing what I'm doing, but I would have said, "Hey, listen, can I come too?" And I would have checked out the restaurants for them. Before I go, would you go along with that? I would have tried to tell them what to do. That's what I'm trying to say. They've got their mindset oh about God. this, okay? That's just me. Yeah. And then I would have jumped in to the hot plate myself and said, how about this? I would feel really better if you would let me check out a couple of restaurants. And then would you mind if I came with you and I won't bother you, but... I, will, I would like to be able to disinfect things and make sure everything is okay. And then I would have gone and sprayed everything, meaning <laughs> the <this> silverware, <laughs> meaning bring your own silverware and put it on the plate. You see, you're probably fine with the cooking and the plates. And the, if you're in a restaurant where they have a Hobart dishwasher, you have nothing to fear. It's like a sterilization unit in a doctor's office. But if you're going to go to, you know, Hoboken's little cafe, you should go before them and see what the situation is. 
Is there social distancing in the restaurant? Are they spraying the tables? For heaven's sakes, I used to freak out with waiters and waitresses who just took the old cloth and wiped the table before we sat down. Love that stuff. Now, give me your, give me your rag and let me spray it first you know, on both sides, and then I'll let you wipe the table. You get, you see what I mean? And they're not gonna get upset with you. You have to be humor. You know, you think they're 80 years old. I got news for you. <laughs> they're probably about 10 or 12 years old right now. See, that's the reality of this. And they're fed up with being inside. <laughs> and you know, the worst thing that's possibly happened in this whole COVID situation is for the elderly to be locked up and for the kids to be locked up because a lot of kids today with parents in America who both work, they don't have great relationships with them. You know, and they go to school to get free from the home situation. And now you're locking them up in the home situation in situations that can actually be dangerous, you know. But with older people, the geriatrics are great because I was, I worked in a rest home for two or three years. And, uh, you know, just like Bonte worked in one in California. And these people are great. They're like little children, you see? So my suggestion, when you, you know your parents now, you know what they're gonna do if you say, I would prefer you go. That's the wrong way to say it, <laughs> you know? I have an opinion and would like to state it, that's fine. And then if they're adamant, then say, okay, okay, how about this, mom? Play with them and get in there with this. Get in there with this and everything else you wanna take with you. If you wanna clean silverware and take it and take it off the table and use your own, Bet and I did that twice at Goa. First restaurant was a disaster. <laughs> The cook, they left, they went back to their villages, <laughs> you know, and the, and the guy he opened it up when I went to pick up the glasses and we went into a little restaurant to get an omelet for lunch. What, what's wrong with an omelet? What can be confusing about an omelet? And only the owner of the restaurant was there and he went in and cooked the omelet. I'm not kidding. It was just like the cardboard on this, on this, uh, on this, uh, it's like cardboard. And I, he wanted to charge us and I didn't fuss. I knew what was happening right away. He went in there and he came out exhausted after cooking two omelets. You know? He didn't put any water in the eggs and he overcooked them so they were dry, like really cardboard, you know, and, oh, and it was a simple thing. It was a bread omelet. It's a special omelet. They do a bread omelet is like they put the bread in over it, you know, and the bread, <laughs> The bread must have been about four days old. We could hardly chew it. But I paid him for it. You know, I, I thought he was really brave because he was trying to save his business, for heaven's sakes. But don't be afraid of going and questioning restaurants, questioning any place they want to go. And just because they don't get sick this time, don't let them get cocky. I want you to go out, order this online. And I want you to just set yourself up so that you're armed and say next time you have a little bag and you say, okay, since I'm pretty sure you're going to go and you two are going to do this. Okay, I'm coming with you and I'm going to spray everything and see what happens. Have some fun, Sarah. Cut loose. This is your opportunity to have a giggle because they're not 80 years old. They're not. <laughs> Sure, I get that. I'm not necessarily always told where they go. I managed, I managed to stop another reckless plan. That was to travel to France during the middle of this. That was about a month or so ago. I don't know. I, uh, so, <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't follow them around everywhere. And you know, record, I have my own life that I'm doing. Just for the record, as a monastic, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you how to have fun with yeah. older people. I took one older lady out because she couldn't stand it just to the vegetable place down the street. I took her, but I, we, we actually got a trishaw, three, a three-wheeler. I sprayed that three-wheeler on the seat and the floor and the back and the bars that you hold on to and everything. I won't even get in a three-wheeler without this. This is 
like 99.9% germ kill. That's great. 99.99%. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so um, I'm only sorry about one thing in this whole thing. I'm sorry I didn't invest money in this stuff. Because, <laughs> oh boy. And, you know, honestly, think of it. And you know, see, you're put. Don't put yourself through a bunch of stuff. You know, keep checking on them now for ten days. Okay, keep checking on them. Okay. But but um, the one thing you can even talk to them about this. Say, I didn't mean to be so silly and so severe. It's just that I really love you, and they know that. You know. But then you ask them. Listen, if you guys want to go out again. Sister Camus gave me a great plan. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna spray everything. I'm gonna make sure you don't have to worry about a thing. I will bring the silverware, okay? I will bring the silverware. Because silverware is funny. I don't trust silverware <laughs> for some reason. I just don't. And as a, as a nun, I always have my chopsticks or I have my little wooden spoon. And if I'm in my bowl, I've been using my spoon a lot lately. That's my, my case on it. You need to forgive yourself. Let this go. You tried. Okay, now turn it around into something more fun so they'll be open to it. That's all I can tell you. What do you think, Pharrell? You think so? Yeah, okay. I, that's, that's just what I think, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sister Kema, I have a question for you. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is that uh, it's on the sutta. Okay, I can't see you. Can you see? Okay. Yeah, okay, I can see you now. So the question is on the sutta that you just read. So mm -hmm. can you please tell, tell me in short, uh, in the three watches of the night, which were the three true knowledges that Buddha got? Uh, so, you know, it's he says the first true knowledge in the first uh, watch of the night, and then the second true knowledge in the second watch, and the third true knowledge in the third watch. So, what is I'd it like that to, you want the knowledges or you want to know the watches of the night? No, I want to know the knowledge in short. Uh, you know, this, yeah. this he got in the first second. Yeah, okay. Okay, the first knowledge, the first knowledge was past lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Which you said, which you said was about karma, uh, uh, how actions follow you over various lifetimes. That no. is what. Well, that's kind of what it, this, um, it, it teaches you about karma. You know, you believe that karma is real. A lot of people, I didn't believe karma was real. I, I always had a different eternalistic view. Um, I kind of knew something was going on because I was channeling some. And so uh, why would these people have anything to do with me, the, the people that I was channeling with? That was something I was doing a long time ago, but I still can do it, but I don't spend much time with it anymore. Um, so the um, what I saw in this paragraph, really, by going into any past life work, he, he slipped into it. And of course, he had what, the ability to do thousands, thousand births, a whole world contraction and a whole world um, expansion and all of that, and whole eons of how many births. We don't be concerned with that. <laughs> we don't, if, if you just, uh, I have this thing where uh, I, asked, I asked Auntie once, why did you let me do that? Because some people, they can get so fascinated in it that they just keep playing around with past lives and they don't ever complete the path and they don't ever wake up to use everything in life. But, um, he said, because you had enough equanimity and you, I trusted you. And it was good you trusted me because what I didn't have an interest for addiction to this because you can get addicted to this and then start talking about it. And people think, oh my God, you're really something. That's not what this is about. 
when I, uh, the reason uh, I, I actually uh, had the experience with that was because of the phobias and wanting to get rid of the fear of, of heights, okay? which it is a good process. And now these psychologists have written about it. It's getting to be looked at as, as a new viable modality for the person as an avenue to help somebody get rid of a phobia. You can try it sometime. I helped another woman get rid of the fear of swimming by getting her to, our method is different, getting the person to the level of equanimity where it's safe for them to recall past lives. And we, we learn how to roll time backwards and it seems to take place naturally in the human being if you start to roll time backwards that it'll just start happening if you trust it. And if you're not believing everything that you experience is real, because it can be pretty scary, you know, some of the things that you turn up. Another way of doing it that is some people consider safer and they consider it more stabilizing is to be sitting with a hypnotist and have them do it that way and let the person track back and they would go for a series of period of time to recall the past lives. And it, this would help them sometimes uncover a gift they might have and they can't figure out why they are, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden able to play the piano or able to do this or that, or something like that. But I think that, that it's very useful. I just wanted to know a way of finding out about the height. So that was the first one. And I really believe in the validity of it. I believe these people were real. And I, I, I asked him once, could I go back and find out more? He said, yeah, if you really want to, but aren't you on track? And I said, yeah, I'm on another track. I don't want to do this, but I could go back and find out the name of the person, the family, the whole bit if I want. But what's the point of it? It doesn't have anything to do with now. That was my... I'm, Functionally, if you want addicted to something, I'm addicted to finding out what is useful right here and now for people to really suffer. That's what I'm interested in. The second one, the second one was a confirmation of the scale of karma. And, uh, you know, um, this one, I told you, just based on my own feeling, the question of does hell really exist? So the Buddhists have, are involved with, um, you know, something like 32 different realms. <laughs> and can you really believe this stuff exists? And so I decided to open my mind to why am I think, why am I forcing myself to say it can't exist when I don't have any proof of whether it does exist or not? Why, but why am I adamant to say it doesn't exist? And the problem over time was finding out that you have someone who is, um, uh, you know, academically oriented and analytically oriented in their mind. They might not accept anything unless it's scientifically proven point, 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 like in science, okay? Then you have other people who will accept something by experience to say, you know, this is absolutely real. And I had an experience and he told me what to do. He said, just, um, he wanted me to try to go down to a hell and, uh, and just hang out. And I said, what do you mean hang out? Sit there and see if there's anybody next to you. And, and then if you can do it, ask them why they're there. So I did a couple of them. And I was fascinated because I felt like the whole scale of the comma in 135 is actually a real thing. And I don't have any dream of convincing you it's real or anyone else. But it's just my own experience of finding out that I think these places are real. And, I, and the more they discover in astronomy right now in the universe, and the more that they turn up and other things, I'm pretty convinced that the Buddha was talking for real, you know, but I'm not going to say one way or another, I, and I don't care one way or another whether anyone else thinks so, you see, but for me it makes sense, and just the fact, the easy way to check the scale of karma, meaning is it real, every, you know, uh, 
I was writing a book called the Nevermind book and each one of the languages, they all have something that means, hey, let it go. Just let it go. Don't get stuck on it. Just let it go by. There's a problem. Let it go and keep going. Well, um, so this one is another kind of thing. And um, um, I just lost that train of thought. That's interesting. <laughs> I just, I just kind of lost the connection. Um, <clears throat> but the um, the thing about um, oh yeah, the languages also have an expression. They all the languages have the same expression. What goes around comes around. You know, do unto others. Um, as you would have them do unto you. It's not confined to the Christian church, but you have it in Shakespeare. You have it all over the place in different countries. And it's basically, you know, what goes around comes around. What you put out, you get back. Well, that's karma. You want to prove it. You look at what you did when you were in your teen years. Look at where you are in your 30s and see how much of it is coming back on you as a result of what you did back there, and you can see how things come out. So this is for each person to figure out on their own scale. That's the second one. He used that second one. Um, and he describes that pretty clearly. Okay, and then the third one, the third one is having to do with um, actually completely understanding the four noble truths in their context of when you listen to it there is suffering then there is the origin then there is the cessation then there's the way leading to the thing to get it utterly and completely really really truly get it and then he shows you right away he shows you how to treat the taste and in, in the abolishment of the taste or the abandonment of the taste he said, I knew directly as it actually was. Uh, there are taints. There are the origin of those taints, the cessation of those taints, and the way leading to them. So here he took the four noble truths and he applied it in an, active, in, a, in an act of abandoning one of the major things, which is the taints. So as far as your paramis, okay, and your fetters and your taints, how do you let go of them? And he's telling them, you apply the four noble truths. Tell me what they are. Tell me what the cause of it is. Tell me what the cessation of it looks like. Tell me the path to the cessation of it. And that's what we're talking about, changing ourselves for noble truths. It's the steps to changing a habit of being in the wrong perspective, taking it personally and getting pain from it and suffering into the impersonal part, taking it impersonally and taking it. Um, so it's not causing suffering, you see? Okay? Okay. And then, so that's what he's talking there. And then he says, I knew and I saw that my mind was liberated because once you get through that last one and these three things, this is the way to the experience of Nibbana. I get by seeing this step by step, I was liberated from the taint of sensual desire of being, which I think is the reactions and the, the, um, the desire to be born again and continue and continue with it. You see, I, would, I got free from that and I was free from ignorance. And what we taught you was, <coughs> uh, what we taught you was that the, uh, when you're liberated, there comes the knowledge, I am liberated. You can feel yourself being free from it. Then you start living your life, noticing whether you really are free from it. And can you let things go? Can you? Or do you have to control everything and, you know, try and make it be the way I personally want it to be or let go? So that he's telling you here, the reaction stop, the push toward Okay, the being, if we say it's reactions, we're talking about it that way. Reactions stop, and this is what happened to the girl where she fell into the deep equanimity. All reactions stopped. Only observation, computation, response. That was all. And it happened without her trying to make it happen. 
which tells you that the flow of this practice internally is healing you as you go along. Some people have left the practice for up to six months and come back and they can't understand, how could I be further along than when I stopped? Odd. How could I be further along than when I stopped? Well, because something is cutting loose inside the human being and moving toward the ocean. Sort of like going down a river, it's going to keep going down the river toward the ocean. That's opening up. People understand that Well, I think a uh, lot of uh, background noise. Hello. Okay, no, okay. We all set? Is that a good? Okay, I think uh, we have already uh, the time uh, nine, already it is nine, two and a half hours. Wednesday. <laughs> okay, so we're all set? We're okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me do the prayer, okay? Here we go. <clears throat> May suffering once be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have acquired, thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May yeah. beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power yeah. share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensations. Uh, 